So today we are looking and continuing again with The Conquest of Bread with Peter Kropotkin. Right now, today we're looking at chapters four through six. Uh, Chris, uh, you want to kick it off with this one, um, with the start of chapter four? Yeah, so start of chapter four, we basically got a, uh, you know, we've got uh, basically the introduction of this idea of expro expropriation with Am I saying that right? Expropriation. So it's the idea that uh, you basically would take stuff from people and then uh, you wouldn't really have an ownership, right? So in other words, you'd have kind of this collective ownership, but you wouldn't have a specific ownership of a specific thing. So you wouldn't have ownership of land. You wouldn't have ownership of companies, uh, largely the means of production, these kinds of things. So he's setting up uh, in this chapter four, he's setting up what expro expropriation is all about and then he gets into the specifics in the following chapters after that talks specifically about food clothing housing that kind of stuff because right. for each of those things there's obviously some uh some issues that might arise when you're when you're trying to expropriate that kind of stuff so he talks about a situation where uh so rothschild was you know one of the we we've all heard that name before because basically this is people who have been able to hold on to that wealth throughout time Right. And he talks about the situation where Rothschild uh, admits, I am quite willing to admit, said he, that my fortune has been accumulated at the expense of others. But if it were divided tomorrow among the millions of Europe, the share of each would only amount to four shillings. Uh, very well, then I undertake to render to each his four shillings if he asks me for it, which is, of course, ridiculous, because how many people, especially poor people, are ever going to actually run across uh, Rothschild and so be able to collect on that and then uh, also it's it's kind of a silly idea that that money in general wouldn't be used to give uh, each person some amount of money it would be expropriated so that there could be some kind of common good something that you actually could achieve for the uh, the society as a whole what do you what do you think Peyton yeah so I found I found it really fascinating how he opens up the book opening up the book specifically telling this story of Rothschild facing calls to give away his money after it was being threatened by the Re revolution of 1848 so this is his strategy right uh, this is the strategy of how Rothschild is going to keep his money, it would seem, by saying, oh, well, sure, yeah, I'll give you I'll give you your four shillings. And he would hand it out with a sardonic smile, just, you know, smiling about it because he knows that this isn't really how any serious revolution can come about. This is just to appease the masses. Right. And he would, and he would. If someone came up to him, here's your four shillings, here's your four shillings, here's your four shillings, right. and then kept going on his way. And, of course, he still had his wealth at the end of all that. And this goes to the sort of common conception of, uh, of expropriation that the sort of middle class and upper class ha holds, according to Kropotkin, right? He lays it out at the beginning that uh, um, he lays out this example, for instance, of whether or not in order to expropriate overcoats, they would just pile up all the coats in the city and then have all the everyone jump on it and take all the coats and he says this is a ridiculous concept of expropriation and so he's kicking off the chapter of expropriation by specifically calling into question the common conception of uh, calling into question the common conception of expropriation and then now he's going to move in to criticizing this um and he's saying that a uh, and then he goes on to say like sort of what's the fault in this what's the fault in this well he says uh quote but at the root of this argument there is a great error those who propound it have never paused to inquire whence came the fortunes of the rich a little thought would however suffice to show them that these fortunes have their beginning in the poverty of the poor and this is how he's starting out his argument for how we need to expropriate it's like well in order to figure out how we should expropriate we need to figure out where their wealth actually came from in the first case uh right. and so that's how he's uh he he's actually beginning this and so he then goes on to tell us a little tale from the middle ages and how large wealth was accru uh, accrued in the middle ages he tells a story of how barons, once they got a large area of sort of fertile land in the valley, would put up signs to the passerbyers, to the people who were, you know, um, traveling the land because they, they were poor or because they had been forced out of their land from pestilence or, you know, various other kinds of reasons, saying that you can come and live on this land rent-free for a certain number of years, then we will begin to rent you. Uh, Chris, you want to go through uh, go through that story a little bit? You had anything to say about it? Because it's kind of interesting yeah, as it so unfolds. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. So those two points you just mentioned, uh, I really like because I think it really sums up uh, an interesting point that I see him making throughout these chapters that we're discussing today, but especially this first chapter where, you know, I think in this country we like to think of capitalism like uh, was it Mark Twain who said that Americans think of themselves as uh, temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Right. So in this country, you know, we're born with this idea that, you know, many of us are born either you know middle or or lower and if we work hard enough we'll rise up and we'll get out of that american dream and if, if everyone just worked harder there wouldn't be any poor and the point one of the points that he makes repeatedly throughout this chapter is that um poverty poverty is not just that well we're not doing capitalism quite right so there's still some poverty it's it's actually necessary you can't have um you can't have this kind of a system without the poverty because no one's going to work for what he repeatedly calls wage slaves wage slavery no one's going to do that if you have food at home and you have your basic needs to live out a productive life and make sure that your family has a productive life why would you go work for minimum wage at a job where they treat you like garbage and uh, why would anyone do that so you can't you you literally have to have poor people for capitalism to function Right. If 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 we if we raised right. up everyone's stat, uh, level of living, the the capitalism wouldn't work anymore. Right. So Kropotkin goes in to explain why that's the case, and he uses the example of the medieval baron, and he goes through through the sort of present day how that continues into the case of capitalism. So, for instance, the medieval right. baron he for you know he gets people onto the land for free for a short am amount of time, and apparently this is according to Kropotkin at least something that. Uh, actually happened. I don't know enough about medieval sort of history to know whether or not this is the case, that they would put up these signs attracting people to come for a number of years. And then after maybe eight years, nine years, then they would start taxing. And then three years later, they'd re increase the tax taxes. Then they'd, you know, begin to institute various kinds of laws and so on and so on and so on until you end up in a situation where people are essentially slaves and they can't leave the land. Um, right. And so that's an interesting example of how that actually came to be. And the example there, the clear case, though, is that those people never would have gotten into that situation, never would have gone into that situation had they not been poor. And so, in other words, right. the idea is that these right. people are poaching up on um, the valley. I, I can't help, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but using the idea of the feudal baron seizing upon the high points of the valley, that's one of the sort of quotes from the book. I, I, I wonder if that's an allusion to the idea of, you know, robbers who would, you know, sort of hide out along the high points of a, mm. of a passage and then sort of, you know, pounce on passerbyers and the like. Um, now, I, I don't, <laughs> I, I think that uh, it's a pretty interesting, um, pretty interesting observation to make there. Um, and I think it's important, he, he really hammers this point home where I think it, it puts the power, a lot of times we think that the power, like in capitalism, lies with the capitalists because they're the one making all the decisions. But I think he kind of puts a point to it here to show us, hopefully to like motivate us, that the power actually lies with the workers because he shows this, this, uh, this baron that has all this land, so he sees some land. His land is not worth anything if there's no poor people there to work the land. Right. He gets rich by taking his share from those people working the land. The only people that are going to come work his land are poor people. He needs poor people on that land in order to make him rich. He's he essentially has nothing. If the workers just one day said, no, we're not working, then that person has no money, right. just like he, the workers. He makes a great um, example here. And it's curious how this compares to capitalism to as it works today. But he says here, quote, so the poor wretches come to settle the settle on the barons land. They make the roads, drain the marches, belt marshes, build the bridges in nine or 10 years. Then the baron begins to tax them. And so it made me realize, you know, like or it, it sort of pointed out to me, like how clearly it is the case that it's the workers there who are developing this land and the owners aren't actually doing anything about it. One of the sort of great arguments that you oftentimes hear from defenders of capital is this idea that, well, the owners of land, they're the ones who actually uphold the land. They're the ones who end up, you know, sort of developing, for instance, in the case of, I mean, housing is a little bit different, right? But it's the owners who end up doing the investment and they end up, you know, building it. But then, of course, it's actually the workers who are the ones 
who are doing it, they're just paying for it, right? But so there, there may be a little bit of a, a sort of disanalogy there is my point between the sort of feudal argument that he's using to develop it and then the uh, contemporary capitalist argument. It's still, of course, the case that it's relying on the exploitation of wage, uh, but the sort of direct analogy does seem to be, it, there seems to be a slight difference there between, I think, the feudal case and the, and the capital case. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, that was uh, just one thing that I observed. Uh, now, moving into part two of uh, of the next chapter, there he begins now to compare compare the feudal case to the capital case specifically, right? So then he goes into this example of a middle class person who suddenly finds themselves in possession of a large sum of money. In this case, twenty thousand pounds, and it becomes a question of, well, what do you do with it, right? Do you just live in senseless in senseless luxury of two thousand pounds a year? Uh, at, you know, at this time would have been to what it would, would have been senseless luxury uh, for 10 years and then run out of money. And he says, well, no, actually, the practical person, the practical person. Well, what they do is they keep their fortune intact and, uh, you know, win themselves a snug little annual income. They go to the investment bank and they invest in some capital and they, you know, take out a certain amount of amount of money. And then over time, they'll end up with a larger and larger and larger sum. And he goes on to conclude um, in his case, he seems to he he uh, makes the argument essentially that this practicalness, the the case of practical men, what they do um, is nothing but grounding the face of the poor. That frugality in the capitalism is nothing but grinding the face of the poor. Uh, Chris, what do you think about that uh, that particular case? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting to note this situation. It kind of goes back to this. Uh, this idea that yeah the only way this system works is by yeah grinding the face of the poor i remember i actually read that a couple of times when he said it because it's obviously a it's a very graphic description um and I, and i think it's a good one right i mean we have this idea we're constantly told well in capitalism if you just if you just work hard enough then you can do whatever you want well has has jeff bezos worked as hard as literally tens of millions of people put together like is that effort that he put forward no he got where he is by grinding the face of his workers right we've all heard stories about his workers wearing diapers because they can't go to the bathroom because they can't you know that they're not given enough time to go to the bathroom and get back in time all this kind of stuff i mean that's really what this is about is you're just exploiting the poor. And, and as we looked at, it doesn't work if you take that away, right? Yeah, and I mean, the idea again being, of course, that these workers would not accept pay if would not accept work from the uh, from the capitalist if they were if they had their basic needs met. Now that's going to be a question that once we get to the end of this uh, chapter, maybe we can ask some questions about. Uh, but that's his posit, right? Because he's saying that ca the wage system inevitably depends on their being poor. Um, but I, I do think there's a question to be raised here. What does he mean by their being poor? Does he mean to say relative poor, poor relative to other people? Or does he mean to say that there's an absolute level of poverty that once passed, people won't accept the wage system anymore? I think that's a question that we're going to have to ask Kropotkin as this book goes forward, as, as it unfolds, because that's the linchpin of his argument. If he's wrong there, he's wrong on a couple of other things. Yeah, so I guess I think of it in terms of like a hierarchy of needs, right? Those are like basic needs that you need met in order to be some, mm -hmm. some, you know, sort of moderately functional in society when you get below that. And and there's room for arguing over what those are. I would put in modern day, I would say in order to be a functioning member of society, you kind of need decent internet, right? And yet we still mm -hmm. have, a, you know, some people would say, oh, internet, that's a luxury. You don't need that. But I don't know how you get a job if you can't fill out a form online and file your taxes and all this sure. kind of stuff that everyone does online, but a lot of people still think of that as, you know, I, I would think of it as like a utility. Some It's like electricity, water, mm -hmm. it's things that you need in order to have a productive lifestyle. Once those things are met, and you know, it, I think maybe it comes down to if you and someone else are trying to accomplish something and it's 10 times harder for you to do it, then there's some kind of in, inequality. Like for instance, getting into college. If, if, it, if someone else has to work 10 times harder to get into college because their neighborhood has bad schools and all this kind of stuff, then maybe, and maybe I'm kind of taking us off on a, on a different track than, than just basic needs, but that sort of level of, you know, we can't just leave people behind, 
so that you know and just say well fend for right. yourself well it's, well it's i'm sp i'm specifically referring to his his arg <clears throat> excuse me his arguments against the wage the wage system right because he's ar his yeah. argument is clearly that the wage system is an issue and his argument against the expropriation because it's a historical oh. form of argument is that um the wage system inevitably depends on there being poor and that second point there being that once once there are no more poor once there are no more poor, then people will not be willing to accept the wage system. Then the question becomes, right, the, it's, and this is an empirical question, right? This is, a, this is a question which you can do studies, you could do research and try to figure out, is a question of, well, is it the case that poverty in that sense, in the sense that, you know, where we won't accept wage systems anymore, is one where it hits an absolute level where, you know, once these certain basic needs are met, then people will no longer take, you know, take take into the wage system or is right. it the case that it's a relative comparison to one another in which case you know there are some questions or is it the case that one's conception of their basic needs changes with the relative sort of tides of um of society but let's uh let's move on because i think that we're going to get that question sort of answered for us that's why okay. i was sort of posing it early on to see you know sort of what uh what would come about so in part three or was there anything else in part two that you were uh taking Let's a look see, at I'm looking at part two um no i thought it was interesting when he talked about nine tenths of the great fortunes made in mm. the united states yeah. are the result of knavery on a large scale assisted by the state so he's kind of throwing that in there that first of all like these things that we think of well it's it's okay because it's legal if something's legal it's okay to do but he's saying no this is essentially large-scale knavery which i think you could uh, accuse uh, you know let's name off billionaires how far down would we get before we find one that we can't accuse of essentially stealing from their workers um, and then assisted by the state so he's throwing that in there which i guess is true if we have a system based on capitalism capitalism is stealing from people then the state is effectively um assisting that especially since the state is the enforcement arm of these things right when someone um you know when so when there's a dispute over who owns something a lot of times the state is called in to settle that dispute so i think it's it's fair to say that the state uh the state shares some of that responsibility or or a large part of that responsibility yeah yeah definitely uh definitely he links in the state there really closely with questions of industry um and actually we're going to see a lot more of that i think in the next chapter um quite clearly so do you have any um any other thoughts on chapter four do you want to just jump to chapter five then or uh, let's see. No, I guess that's that's good for four, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so chapter five is, I think, really, really interesting, right? So chapter five is a little bit longer than some of the other chapters that we've seen in this book. But one of the sort of central ideas which he gives to us in chapter uh, five, or, or something I, I should say that, you know, might help us make sense of chapter five, is Aristotle's actual idea of sort of the virtuous mean uh, or, or sort of the mean of virtue, right? So if you're not aware, Aristotle presented this idea of virtue, and it was a unique idea at the time that virtue is at the mean, and then there's sort of two vi – there's a vice of excess, and then there's a vice of deficiency. And Kropotkin is throughout the book, and he comes back to this idea – of placing the utopian thinker or who he sees as himself in the mean between the theoretician and the practical man who he calls the practical man both of them he seems to think have uh, you know a kind of middle class bias or a middle class um uh, or, or an over concern with middle class con they're overly concerned with middle class things and that this ultimately leads them astray of course the theoretician being uh when it comes to the question of revolution being overly abstract has their head in the clouds all concerned with sort of the too abstract and not everyday things the practical man to being too concerned with the everyday thing and then ends up missing the concern of bread which is where you know right. that we get the title of the book um fantastic quote in there uh in chapter five which i'm sure we'll get to um but with that sort of in mind let's go through chapter five uh yeah chapter five here um and specifically talk about uh uh, his his idea for for revolution because he opens up by saying that there's a lot of people 
um, who have these middle class concerns, ideas, for instance, on at least in my book, the first page, he saw he talks about how a number of people are imbued with these Jacobin, what he's calling Jacobin ideas. The government occupied itself, first of all, with political questions such as the reorganization of the machinery of government, the purification of administration, the separation of church and state, civic liberty and such other matters. It is the true workmen's club that they kept an eye on the members of the new government, which often imposed their own ideas on them. And that essentially he goes on to say that, sure, great ideas sprang up during these, ide ide uh, during these times, even ideas that moved the world. But the people were starving in the slums. Right. Um, and so it's an interesting criticism to make of, of the, of the so-called practical people, of the so-called theoreticians that uh you know the pra he talks about how these practical people were concerned every day busy they were you know busy bodies trying to concern themselves on the machinery of government but that they missed the fact that people needed bread that people were hungry i don't know i thought that right. it w that was an interesting contrast to make yeah i thought it was it was very interesting because he's basically accusing these people who keep creating governments of not understanding that until the people at the bottom, until those needs are met, where people have, you know, obviously bread is a stand-in for uh, a few different things, but it's that right. basic need that you, you know, you have to eat. And until you do that, you're you're just not going to have stability in a government because you're mm -hmm. going to have at some point. It's like what we see in in our capitalist society, where you know, when when capitalism keeps hitting the bottom, we've now done it twice in the last 12 years, where you know we really see devastation and especially hitting the poor people the hardest, people are gonna start questioning the system. And I think when it happens twice in 12 years, we're seeing a larger number of people moving towards being progressive, moving towards moving past uh, being progressive, maybe even further left than that. And it's because I think people have witnessed firsthand what happens to society and the people at the bottom, th their needs are not being met by the system of not having enough bread. I have a question for you, so a, a mm -hmm. historical question. I'm not an expert on history. He talks here on the next page about um, how basically the middle class are the ones who decide governments. When, when they say middle class, they don't mean middle class like we have in the United States, right? They're talking about a smaller, higher level middle class, right? Is that what is that what he's referring to? Um, yeah, so that's a really tricky question because middle class can refer to a couple different things in this time period and and again i'm not i'm not an expert either right so uh but from what i do know the little bit that i do know about this is middle class oftentimes meant a kind of like tradesman class or a kind of the the classes are very different i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily map directly on a uh, middle class what we mean today by middle class to what he means by middle class because he also i think there is a conception of like a very specific kind of job a very specific kind of you know rent seeking which is attached to the idea of middle class in his um in his time which we might not as well he gives for instance in the previous chapter the example of a tradesman who doesn't really actually trade right like in the past for instance so this was in chapter right. four he talks about how in the past a tradesman would be someone who carried their stuff on their back and then you know they, they really traded for the love of adventure in its own sake and you know in a certain way whereas the tradesman today is someone kropotkin says and this is you know written in like the 18 uh what is it 1860s 1870s um and he's saying that the tradesman today basically can just sit at his desk and also his goods are insured, so he's not really taking any risk, right? And so I think that there, this is kind of the idea of the middle class that, uh, that Kropotkin would have. I don't think that middle class necessarily means um, like a certain sort of threshold of, of wealth. So it, but it in is that a case, different. it would be someone, uh, if I'm thinking of the same example, you're, that was a person who instead of like, was it a shoemaker or something, instead of making their own shoes, they start hiring people to make shoes. And essentially, they own a business of shoes. So we're, I right. guess, with the way I interpreted it, we're talking about uh, like a smaller, but maybe elevated group of people that would call middle class, like some, I guess, in some cultures, the middle class is considered people that have a l large luxury time, right? They don't, they're not just sort of working all the time. Anyways, it's a small point. But I was just wondering, because he kind of says, yes. a lot of times he blames these societies on the middle class failures to consider 
the, the right and this is and this is fortunate in their needs for bread right and that's why it's i think linked to this idea of sort of the the sort of virtuous mean that i was mentioning there earlier that kind of the theoretician is overly concerned with middle class values and the practical person who he comes back to later on when he you know, criticize them saying that they don't have any concept of how hungry people actually act because they've been, you know, they've had their stomach full their entire life, right? Uh, you know, th that, that's the criticism of the practical people that he gets to later in, the, later in the chapter, but the theoretician has been middle class, and so they're abstracting away all of these middle class concerns. So it's an interesting way there in which, you know, he seems to say that all of the revolutions have in the past have been essentially middle class in substance and that that's one of the major right. criticisms um criticisms of it so yeah uh i would uh i would say so um actually i want to read a read a quote here this is right before the close of part one he says the idea of the people will be to provide bread for all and while the middle class citizens and workmen infested with middle class ideas admire their own rhetoric in the talking shops and the practical people are engaged in endless discussions on forms of governments we the utopian dreamers we shall have to consider the question of daily bread yeah, so I think that right there you sort of just saw the idea um, how he's contrasting these utopian dreamers uh, with the so-called practical people. He's saying that actually, no, you know, it's absurd to say that concerning yourself with bread is actually utopian and that it's the practical people right. who are actually utopian because they're the ones who are sitting around sprawling questions of government, questions of you know, checks and balances and, bal you know, and all these questions he would seem to say are absurd if you don't first tackle the question – of bread because he does open bread. up he does open up by saying that these are great ideas he says that these are great ideas and that these ideas have moved the world and that certainly they're part of the revolution so he he's not necessarily dismissing the ideas of the practical person or the theoretician but he's saying that these are not the first questions of a revolution right and i think it's interesting how that ties together with the last chapter where he talked about well in a capitalist system you need the poor and then now we're seeing how well in these in these systems they're basically the 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 poor aren't having any say on how this government is run. It's the middle class, the ones who large middle class and higher mm -hmm. who are forming this government, the ones who benefit from the capitalist system, which is necessary. It, it necessarily needs to have a poor. So you can kind of see this circle here where it goes from, you know, the capitalism needs poor people. And then uh, also these governments are designed in a way to make sure there are poor people, that there are people who don't have their bread. So it's a, it's kind of a, two steps right and he actually this, connects this, this and he reasoning. right and he connects that very idea i mean this might be skipping ahead a little bit so we may have to go back but he's uh, mentioned this at the very beginning of part three when he's talking about attempts at state socialism um and you know again this is kropotkin's view right but kropotkin here is criticizing many of these ideas of sort of what he's calling state socialism or state approaches to revolution because they leave the wage system intact it's essentially saying mm -hmm. here so at the start of uh, part three, let me just read the quote here. He says, the most prominent characteristic of our capitalist system is the wage system, which in brief amounts to this, that a man or a group of men possessing the necessary capital to start some, in, uh, some industry undergoes, um, some industry then undergoes to supply the factory and workshops with the raw materials to organize production, to pay for employees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. And then he goes on to say how collectivism as we know it, and he's, you know, this is going back to something he mentioned earlier, talking about, again, sort of state approaches of revolution um, does not attempt to abolish the wage, wage system, though it introduces considerable modifications to the existing order of things, et cetera, et cetera. He goes on to say that, like, it's not as bad as capitalism, right, that these approaches are not as bad, but he doesn't ultimately think, first of all, he's, he seems to, he straight out says he doesn't think that they're, that they're going to work. He says that they're, that they're not even practical ideas. He doesn't think that they're going to work. But then he also goes on to say that they're not even... Um, the right approach to things anyway, um, because they don't abolish that wage system. They still ultimately, right. because again, this is again, that linchpin question about the wage, the wage system that we brought up earlier. He thinks that the wage system necessitates, necessitates that there's poverty. And again, this right. goes back to his conception of what poverty is. It goes back to this claim that he sort of makes, but doesn't necessarily argue for, at least as of yet, maybe he will future, you know, further into the book, but he's making the claim that poverty is an absolute position, that it's not a relative position where, you know, you are poor relative to other people, um, that, you know, there's a sort of base level of poverty that once satisfied, you will not serve 
other people essentially that once that base level of needs are set that you won't engage in wage wage system again that's the empirical question um that we're still waiting on an answer for for the rest of uh for the rest of the book that uh you know we got brought up in the last chapter yeah and his his overall i'm sort of he didn't say this specifically i'm kind of reading into it but his overall procedure seems to be that when something comes about that is problematic or can be abused or can can get out of control it, the answer is simply to eliminate it right so the wage system can be manipulated by capitalists who, so as long as that wage system is there capitalism can capitalists can use it as leverage on people who don't have much power and they need to work so that I, I kind of going back to what you were saying the idea here is well wage this wage system will eventually turn into wage slavery so simply don't have it same argument with the government right uh, that that he's mm -hmm. making in the book is where he's saying well the government is problematic so you you just kind of don't have it right you don't you don't have right. it right well uh, well it also goes back to the idea of the baron that we mentioned at the beginning of it which is that it gets worse and worse and worse that's his argument right, right? he argues that it just right. gets worse and worse and worse um, at least that's sort of his uh, his claim there essentially that over time, it's going to end up getting worse because, well, the state's just going to increase their power and hold on you. The capitalist is going to exploit you as much, as much, as much as possible. Um, right. So, so yeah, I want to go back a little bit then to, to part three. I said there when I moved to part three, uh, or excuse me, back to part two, I said when we moved to part three that we may be skipping a little bit ahead. Um, he goes on to talk about, again, he's criticizing the practical men because it opens up with lots of criticism about the practical people. And then he, you know, juxtaposing it to the utopian. And then he goes through and then talking about the theoretician, which he's again juxtap juxtap juxtaposing to the utopian, who he's calling himself concerned about bread. Um, but again, anyway, he's going on to say, we do not know whether the folk who call themselves practical people have ever, ever asked themselves this question in all of its nakedness which is um, essentially the question of uh, wages and uh, wages and the like. But we do know that they wish to maintain the wage system, and we must therefore expect to have national workshops and public works vaunted as means uh, to provide food for the unemployed. And so there's this concern here. He's making a kind of criticism of middle class values where, you know, well, why would we pay for someone who isn't working, right? Um, and he makes a distinction later on how, you know, at the beginning times of the revolution, we can't tell. Um, I can't remember the exact words of this quote because it's not in front of me. Uh, but he says, like, at the beginning of a revolution, we can't tell who are the idlers and who are uh, the um, what well, I can't remember the word, but who are the you know real men who can't find work uh, today. Of course, we would add women. And I think that that's that that's, I think, an interesting I, I found that quote there really interesting that he said that like he does seem to think in a certain way that idlers are going to be a problem but that at the beginning of the revolution the solution is well you just got to feed everybody um and yeah like certainly yeah like obviously you don't want people starving duh um but i just found that to be like an interesting just nugget quote that was just buried in there kind of you know right. out of out of seemingly nowhere which is a discussion when you talk about this kind of stuff. It's a very fair point that gets brought up, which is what about the idlers? And I think that would be worse at the beginning. Like if, if think about the culture of the United States, if we suddenly took that, that uh, system away that we currently have and moved to a system like this, I think there would be a large number of people that go, well, uh, I can get my food whether I work or not, and whether I can participate and, well, you know, Chris and contribute. Well, Chris, actually, Kropotkin has something to say about that, doesn't he, on the in the next chapter? So maybe we should uh, maybe we should save that in the question of. Sure. Uh, actually, I guess. Actually, it's at the very end of this chapter. Uh, so, yeah, we'll we'll come back to that. Uh, we'll come back okay. to that for sure, because he does have something specifically to say on that exact point about whether or not people will start working harder and how long um, how long that might take. So he now sort of goes into criticizing um, the theoretician. And one of the major criticisms that he makes is actually a criticism of Marx here. He criticizes Marx's distinction between simple and complex labor. He says that, uh, you know, these are these ideas that are dreamed up by theoreticians and economists. And he's linking in here, he's combining sort of criticisms of 
like typical economists that you know you, you know, upholding capital and he's also lumping in Marx there as well which is an interesting thing to do that I don't think most leftists would do today um, but it is something that uh, Kropotkin seems to be doing specifically the distinction that he's criticizing there um, is this far-reaching distinction between um, the work of someone who has earned a craft Right. That's that's actually the quote. He says, moreover, collectivism draws a very subtle, uh, subtle, but far reaching distinction between the work of the laborer and the man who has learned a craft. And he says that the unskilled labor in the eyes of the collectivist is a simple laborer and um, that the people who have learned a craft are complex laborers. And he's criticizing that uh, distinction of uh, apparently of Marx. What do you think? Yeah. And it's an interesting point to make because. Um, di different jobs take a different amount of investment uh, to get going. And I don't necessarily mean money investment. I mean time and, you know, education and these kinds of things. So it it seems like definitely there's a discussion to be had there about, well, uh, you know, what about someone who's going to go to school for, say, six years before they start up uh, their job? Should that be treated mm -hmm. differently? I think it's definitely a conversation. I don't know what the answer is, but it's definitely a conversation that I think ha has to be had. Yeah, well, he, he does he does go on to um, talk about, actually, let's just skip to that part sort of um, at the end of the chapter where he's talking about, uh, talking about some of this stuff. He, he uses a specifically biological example to argue that what we need to do is um, essentially we need to move into integration, what biologists call integration of functions. Let me read this quote and then we'll explain what it means. He says, the large towns of, uh, as well as the villages must undertake to till the soil. We must return to what biology calls the integration of functions after the division of labor, the taking up as a whole. This is the course uh, followed throughout nature. So again, we're returning to uh, Kropotkin's longtime love of biology. And he's using this in his, as an example to say that actually, if we want the revolution to work, what we're going to end up needing to do is that the cities, the people who are typical craftsmen, the people who are educated, are actually going to need to start tilling the land and that they can sort of bring their scientific knowledge to bear. He talks about chemists and um, various kinds of scientists bringing their not like botanists bringing their knowledge to bear in order to produce in order to increase the production through various kinds of experiments. Um, on like smaller plots of land and then going out and teaching the countryside how to then increase their own production. So he sees this kind of, it still has the division of labor, but it's still, it, you know, it's again, it's using that biological example of how two different concepts can sort of integrate and come together to create a single, uh, a single function in an organism. It's an interesting organ, or excuse me, it's an interesting analogy to make to use the sort of biological analogy there between sort of city and, and, and body, but I don't know. What do you, what do you think of that? Cause that's a partial answer to what you were saying. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of wondering about that when I was reading it about that point, like is the idea then that the, the culture would become super agrarian if everyone is sort of invested in growing things. I mean, does that mean that other industries are now going to have to pull back because more people are, are putting work into the land itself. And then I was thinking about, well, in modern society, we have so many, you can work land with so many fewer people than you used to be able to. I mean, stuff's, but you know, half these machines are practically automated that, that are on the farm. The, the tractor just goes right. out there by itself and starts doing a bunch of stuff. Um, so, so in some, and this, this I think is to back up what we saw earlier in the book where Kropotkin keeps talking about how um, as time goes on, uh, we can get more and more out of the land for less people. So I guess th those were just questions I was considering. Yeah, while yeah, yeah. This. Yeah, Kropotkin definitely, like, uh, if you all remember from the beginning of the book, Kropotkin really lays out this idea that, you know, we're increasing production and that he uses this actually as like a foundational argument for why socialism is not only possible, but necessary in a certain sense. Um, and I think that if I'm being honest with you guys, I think that this is an example of something that may have worked like if the revolution happened during Kropotkin's time, it might have made a lot more sense. But nowadays, especially in like American society, it is it really is the case that like um, farmland is very, very like I live pretty far away from farmland, right? Like I would have to drive out very, very far, like, you know, 
um, at least an hour in order to go to work to, to till the farm. But I think the idea, though, would be that, you know, if I was a botanist or if I, you know, had expertise in biology, that I would be able to perhaps, you know, lend my expertise to developing different kinds of mechanisms or different kind of tactics to grow far to grow uh, better in order in order to increase production for uh, for the laborers and for the farmers so it is a I think this is an example of something that maybe is a little bit different than like the exact division is maybe a little bit different than how it would be today if today. we were to try to implement something right. like that um, right. I want to go backwards just a little bit here um, to talk about how how Kropotkin is laying out the, um, this concern with uh, concern with food. So this is in uh, part four. It's you know maybe I, maybe a page or two into part four. Um, he's talking about how a number of theoreticians, middle class theorists. Uh, this is where he links the middle class to the theorist. Previously, he had linked the middle class to the um, to the practical people. But again, he's contrasting the theorist and the uh, middle class. But he, he starts off one of the paragraphs here. This is a few paragraphs in. He says, It is necessary to go into detail to pre pre prepare tables to show how the distribution of rations may work to prove that it is just and equitable and infinitely more just and equitable. Uh, and it is an infinitely more just and equitable state of things. All these tables and details will not serve to convince those of the middle class, nor, alas, those workers who are tainted with middle class prejudices, who regard the people as a mob of savages ready to fall upon and devour one another as soon as government ceases to direct affairs. And so this idea here, he uses some arguments to show um, that, you know, if things got really tight, uh, he uses specifically the example of water, where he says uh, uh, um, water's doesn't, water is not allocated this way anymore, but he talks about how water at the time, you know, um, it, you know, the, the, the water companies wouldn't care essentially how much water you were using. Um, and then if there was a time when water was a bit short, they would send it out into the newspapers and say waters are sh water is short, and then people would sort of cut back on their usage of water. Um, and so that is, I think, an instance where um, where he is sort of he, – he's saying that actually people will willingly limit their intake, and he's saying that rations are the most – reasonable thing and it is indeed the thing that's just going to sort of spontaneously occur during a revolution and he's saying that the theoreticians don't understand this because they're engaged in sort of middle class reasoning that um, in fact he has a lovely quote here he says only the man who is full fed does not understand this referring specifically to how people will act when they uh you know when <laughs> when there's a time of need he goes on and talks about how any time that there's a sort of sickness or illness going around and that people are are hungry the first people People who are allocated resources, according to Kropotkin, are the poor and the sick, right? Um, and then, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, I think, argument in case to be made. And he's saying that here that like the middle class theorists who are theorizing about the end of capitalism, that well, they just don't understand that, right? They're saying, well, yeah. you just don't understand that because um, it, it because it, that's just that's just not how you think. You think that because you that he's arguing that well, you you you've always had your food. Uh, given to you. And so as a result, you think that people are just going to be savages as soon as government uh, displaced uh, sort of leaves. What do you think of that? What do you think about that? Yeah, I thought about that. And I, and I have that part with the droughts highlighted where they talk about how people will conserve when there is a drought. And I, and I really thought about that. It seems to me like a lot of the ideas in this book come down to um, basically what your view of humanity is like do you think humanity is a, is something where people will step up and and well, sure. realize we're all a society and mm -hmm. help each other or is it going to be like you know when we saw at the beginning of the pandemic when when there were toilet paper shortages where people were literally buying truckloads of toilet paper and hand sanitizer to turn around and try to sell at exorbitant prices and then you have to ask yourself well I guess if we didn't have a capitalist system, if we didn't have wages, then there wouldn't be the incentive to buy a truckload of toilet paper and try to turn around and flip it for a profit. Right. I, I or, think, or would you still have hoarding and people doing the same kinds of things? Right. I think that that's the point there because, again, he, he's actually making the case that your view of human nature is shaped by your upbringing. So it's – he actually is, is moving a little bit beyond what you just sort of said there. He's saying that actually the view of human nature given – so, excuse me, by the middle class there is not accurate because they've had their food always given to them 
uh, sort of the whole time. So he's actually he would I slightly I think slightly disagree with you and say it's actually not necessarily about your view of human nature. In fact, your view of human nature is shaped finally by your upbringing and by your sort of material upbringing there. Um, I don't know. What, what, I mean, I think that that's an interesting case to be made, and I think it's certainly right, uh, right to some extent. I mean, it goes to that sort of nurture nature debate um, okay. in biology, which has mostly been settled at this point. But it's you know, it's basically like it's both. Um, but like you know, right. it's it's kind of an interesting um, an interesting point to be made. Uh, interesting point to be made there. I think that he is right to say, or at least it's an interesting point to be made here that. Um, you know, someone who has only ever experienced one kind of life, the full fle- the full fed life, is not going to be in a good place to be a theoretician universally of society. I think that that's right. um, like if you were to sort of boil it down to like a, a bumper plate case. Um, I think that that's a good case, and I, and it's almost obvious, right, when you say it that way. Like someone who's only experienced one kind of life probably isn't too great at being a theoretician. Right. So it's a uh, it's, uh, an interesting point there. Yeah. Do, do you have anything else to add on, uh, on this section here or? I don't, nope, not on that one. All right. So you want to move in then? Cause we already mentioned sort of the end of chapter five there. You want to move into chapter six on dwellings? Sure. Sure. Yeah. This was, uh, <laughs> This was one that I, I definitely had to uh, wrestle with some ideas, some of the things that were being brought up in this book, because it's a li- little, uh, you know, little scary idea to think that someone uh, might tell you that you don't get to live in your house anymore. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of my house. It's not like a new house or anything like that, but it's uh, I, I do like it. Um, so it definitely makes me a little uncomfortable to think that it might be decided that, you know, once, once the kids are out of the house, that this is too much house for, say, me and my wife, and that we would we would better serve society if I was now living in a smaller house and a larger family got to move mm-hmm. into my house in, instead, right? So, right. Um, well, well, let's so there's, let's actually let's just go through it. Let's go through his arguments first. You want to go through his right. arguments and see if we find them compelling, and then we can <laughs> sort of air out our. Uh, air you can air out your concerns with it so well yeah and i and i just want to make clear i'm not saying that i disagree with all the points or that all the points in this chapter are wrong i'm just saying they make me uncomfortable right because they're sort well, of chal- you know it's I, it's challenging well, it, these ideas you know so. you know i will say I, I will just make one quick point about that something that i've realized is you know if it doesn't make you uncomfortable it's probably not a revolution and right. i mean you know, you could argue then whether or not you want a revolution, right? Do you ever want to be uncomfortable? But uh, if you think that it's necessary, um, well, anyway, I don't know. That's just something that I've uh, I've I've learned. Some sometimes some ideas make you uncomfortable a lot yeah. of the time. Um, yeah, yeah so, in a good way. I mean, they challenge you. They make you right. They challenge you. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so his argument is essentially that like, well, well, he actually makes a historical argument saying that workers are uh, actually let me just read the quote here. He says the workers are becoming more and more gradually are more and more gradually coming to the conclusion that dwelling houses are in no sense the property of those uh, the property for those of whom the state recognizes as their owner. And he goes on to essentially argue that this is going to continue and that more and more workers are going to get this idea in their head that uh, their property is not really belonging to their owners historically that may not have borne out but it's also a question there of i think the relationship has changed a little bit there whereas you know in the past it really was the case that these were entirely being rented out whereas now there are more people who are able to become owners of like single homes because i mean i think that the kinds of things that he's criticizing here are at in in here where you know you you're a landlord and you own like hundreds of different buildings and there's definitely Definitely still lots of criticism of that. And I think that a lot of people even still do agree with those kinds of criticisms here. Um, but anyway, so the going to the substance of his argument against it, he's saying that the home, first of all, he says here, quote, the house was not built by its owner. It was erected, decorated, and furnished with innumer- by innumerable workers in the timber yards and the brick fields and the workshops toiling for dear life at a minimum wage. And then he goes on to say that the money spent by the owner was not on the product of his own toil. It was amassed, like all the other riches, by paying the workers two-thirds or only a half of what was their due. So, you know, it's essentially built on exploitation. So this goes back a little bit earlier to what we were talking about, the barren and setting up, you know, setting up land and trying to take things from, uh, uh, trying to sort of exploit people with 
um, enticing them essentially with lower wages for a short amount of time. But then he makes a really interesting point here. He says here, quote, the house owes its actual value to the profit which the owner can make out of it. Now, this profit results from the fact that this house was built in a town. That is, it is an agglomeration of thousands of other houses, possessing paved streets, bridges, wa uh, walkways, fine, bell uh, fine public buildings, and well-lit and affordable well lit and affordable to its inhabitants, um, thousands of comforts and convenience unknown in villages. So essentially, the value of the house is based on the value of other homes in it. And furthermore, that value is based on the rents which people pay. So in other words, right. the value of the home is based on the rent which you can possibly make from it. And this is, of course, especially true in a case of, you know, landlords who own lots and lots and lots, right? Um, right. Uh, which is especially true. I mean, and actually, in fact, empirically, generally, your rent is about equal to one twentieth of the actual value of a thing. Um, that's an interesting observation that Thomas Piketty has made um, about sort of the the value of property, which can be rented like just universally. Like that seems to be a general trend across cultures. Um, right. That as we know so far. So it's an interesting claim to be made, and I thought that, that was a fascinating argument. And it goes in, I think, a little bit there to some of the earlier arguments that we heard against ownership for, like, machinery and for the right. ownership of capital. The idea that all of these inventions are conglomerations of previous inventions and that, in fact, ideas like maybe even the number system or various kinds of abstract ideas can help us think about, help us produce new ideas going into the future. So all of these inventions are not really the invention, you know, are owned by the inventor exclusively, but are common inheritance, uh, common ownership. It, that's some of the stuff that he talked about earlier in the book, and he's kind of reapplying that logic down to the question of dwellings. Yeah, and the the, argue, the the point you were making a little while ago about the value of a home being related to the things about it, he even takes it a step further and saying, well, a home in Paris right, it's going to be more expensive, and yet it sort of owes all of that to everything else that's happening in Paris, right? It's sort of mm -hmm. uh, sort of this, this larger collective. And, and housing is a tricky one because, you know, especially in this country, you know, you're brought up to believe that home ownership is part of the American dream. That's one of the things you one day hope to achieve is you have a nice house for your family to live in and raise your kids on a nice street and that kind of stuff. And yet, uh, some of some of I think the most obvious and maybe egregious forms of or violations maybe caused by capitalism happen in homes like we saw after the the last downturn economic downturn of what 12 years ago or so we saw a lot of hedge funds swoop in and buy massive numbers of houses which did two things one it shortened the supply for people who wanted to meet that American dream there were less houses for sale because they were being bought up by hedge funds and then also it raised the prices of the remaining homes so that it's even harder for, for those homes that are left, it's harder for people to mm. buy a home. So here we see this sort of American dream of being a homeowner is actually being destroyed by the capitalism itself. And that's a good argument for, you know, maybe people shouldn't be able to own a hundred homes or, you know, maybe even five yeah. homes, like, uh, you know, owning more than five or whatever. Like maybe there should be some sort of elevated tax for each extra rental home you have or something. Uh, but that would be a capitalist approach to sort of fixing the problem. And so his approach of where there just isn't home ownership would sort of fix that problem because hedge funds wouldn't swoop in and buy a thousand homes in a, well, you know, in a region. Well, what's interesting about it is he seems to think that this would be during the revolution, right? So it would be at the beginning of the revolution, we would take sort of tally of the homes and dwellings that we have. And most specifically, the thing that he seems to be most worried about, right? Like, let's not sort of caricature him or whatever, because the thing that he seems to be most worried about is the fact that there's a bunch of empty homes. There's a bunch of homes out there. In fact, he claims that there's enough empty homes out there to house everybody who doesn't have a home. And in yeah. fact, in fact, Chris, that's something that's still the case today. There are enough empty homes out there that every single homeless person could be given a full house, full house. Right. Um, and I, I remember when I was in high school learning that statistic and just being shocked. I was like, whoa. Right. I mean, it was in fact, in fact, actually, that was one of those statistics out there that was part of my radicalization hearing that statistic. I was like, that's just absurd. That is completely wrong. That's just irrational. You know, that was right. sort of my gut reaction. And I think that that general idea is the same thing which is motivating 
him here. I don't know that he's necessarily talking about like invading people's sort of private space or anything like that. I think well, that, he d- I at mean, some point he def he does. I mean, he pushes towards it, but I think that a lot of it is motivated by this idea that at least initially, if we want to have an equal ju- um, an equal allocation of resources, so that we don't need, so that we don't have wage slavery sort of recurring and right. re- you know recreating itself. Um, you know, again, we need uh, again uh, vis-a-vis sort of Kropotkin's argument for why the wage slave exists or why the wage system exists. Well, part of the only way to get rid of the wage system would be to make sure that everybody has housing. And so this may right. be something that's sort of at the beginning of the revolution and not necessarily like we're constant, you know, in your case, right? Like you're allowed to have yeah. your home now because you have children. And then all of a sudden, you know, your, you know, your kids go off to college and, you know, you get booted out of your house or something like right. that. I'm not sure that that's what Kropotkin has in mind. I mean, it's definitely sort of suggested at some points. I mean, they talk about like, and 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 this is on the sort of the extreme end where he talks about, you know, the servants' quarters. So you're you're not talking about normal working people like myself that have to go to a job. You're talking about people, ultra rich people, but the servants' quarters mm-hmm. would be turned into a dwelling for someone, and the, you know, the the big mansions might house a few a few families instead of just the one family but then he does talk about a situation where you have you know one owner with a house with a bunch of rooms and then you have a mother i think he said a mother with five children who where they're all in one room so then you would you know you would find you'd send in the the tradesmen to fix up that house so that now it could house the woman and her five children as well as possibly the individual who was living there before. Mm-hmm. So it's it, there definitely is not like clear cut about exactly what he's talking about, um, but that he definitely talks about moving people out of the, I think he calls them hovels, mm-hmm. this, and, and moving them into what is, I think he said, five room houses. Well, one of the so. interesting, one of the other interesting points that he makes related to that is he says that actually once we get rid of the wage system, People won't have any need or even any want of these massive mansions or these massive homes. I think he is more worried about the mansion than he is worried about, you know, someone, you know, like, you know, like yourself with a few rooms for your kids. Um, Because he specifically talks about how rich people who previously, you know, they enjoyed their large home now that they don't have the servants working for them then they're going to want to leave their home because they realize how just, uh, you know, what hell it is to have right. to manage this massive home, right. keep all the, you know, this massive lawn cut. And so he even says, essentially says that, like, people are just going to leave their massive mansions if they don't have people working for them at an exploitation wage. Right. <laughs> so right. there I mean, I'd, I'd suppose, depending on sort of your political leanings you might think that that's hand waving or you might think that that's sort of just the continuation of his argument there um but it's an interesting case to be made nonetheless and i think that it does go to suggest that he is thinking more about mansions and he is thinking more about um sort of very wealthy people and possibly even which i I suspect is true that i think i think that's true he is more concerned about the the big stuff although he does keep kind of saying well to each their needs so we'll sort of right organized by well, I, you know, certainly I guess I, you would look at the homes and you would look at the people and then you'd start assigning and you know who who knows what's going to happen if you had an actual revolution who knows what would happen if that was actually taking place but there are some good points being made here right and, and i mean certainly i agree like everybody obviously needs to have a home i right? i mean that's right, right. um now one other point i want to make because he's coming back to this idea of the theoretician he talks about how the theoretician is constantly requesting or, you know, sort of their middle class values, like how we need to uh, pay compensation to landlords. He says here, quote, uh, the people will proceed to expropriate the housing without giving heed to the theories, which will certainly be thrust in their way. Theories about paying compensation to landlords and find, finding the first necessity, finding first the necessity of the funds. Right. So. Um, this is something which held up revolutions for a long time um, historically, like it's sort of in in the French Revolution was idea. Well, we need to pay compensation to landlords. In fact, you know, when slaves were freed, it was everywhere. Oh, well, not I shouldn't say everywhere, but in many places, the, the idea was, well, we have to pay back the, you know, the, the slave owners for their compensation. It was never, ever, not once done where, well, maybe we should compensate the slaves for being owed. Now, again, he's not talking about slavery here, but there is this idea that he's linking in here. Um, He says earlier up, one paragraph up, he's linking it to middle-class values again. 
he's saying, are we going to wait till this measure, which is in harmony with every honest man's system, uh, sense of justice, again, getting rid of landlords, is taken up by the few socialists scattered among the middle class elements of which the provisionary government will be composed. So again, he's linking sort of state approaches to socialism with the middle class there. Um, and how he seems to think that there's this connection there. And I, and I think that this is sort of where we see the connection between the practical side of things and the uh, theoretician, that these people are in there together in forming the sort of state government, uh, you know, in the... Because, again, Kropotkin being a bit of an anarchist there. So it's an interesting, I think, um, I think approach there. He's kind of bringing in together, cl melding together these ideas that he was playing around with in the previous chapters right there. Right. So yeah. do you have any other thoughts on uh, on dwellings or is that uh... I don't think so. It, it, I guess one more point. Um, you know, he mentions here he, he's at the beginning of sort of the opening section of this chapter. He really kind of puts the importance on the dwellings and, and kind of makes it like it's not a revolution until you have done this. He says mm -hmm. um, on the day that the expropriation of houses takes place on that day the exploited workers will have realized that new that new times have come that labor will no longer have to bear the yoke of the rich and powerful that equality has been openly proclaimed that this revolution is a real fact and not a, the, a theatrical make-believe like so many other preceding it so he's saying that it seems like he's kind of putting a line in the sand that's when you know you've had a revolution is when the expropriation uh, when we've gotten place. rid of property relationships, I think that right. if, if I'm being honest with you, Chris, I think that part of the reason why this is such why he, you know, as that quote there bears out, why he's putting such strong emphasis on this is because I think property was much more connected to capital at this time, uh, like land property was much more connected to capital at this time. Whereas today, there's a lot of capital, which is sort of in software or in ideas and information like like so today i think that the revolution might bear slightly different stamps than it would have be bore uh during this time i could be wrong about that and i still think obviously like making sure that everybody like that everybody has homes and you know the like that's obviously like you can't have a revolution without right like duh um right but i do think that there might be other points um which today's revolutionaries should concern themselves with right but i i do see some of the points he makes that if you kept home ownership at the same time that you follow these other steps of expropriation, well, landlords, it's, right. it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of leaving this, this abuse in, in place the, to abuse uh, the different classes for one class to abuse another class and take advantage. Uh, and, and I think that right. point, which means it, that we could never root out the wage system, according right. to Kropotkin. Right. right. So yeah. is that about it for, uh, for today's section or? Do you have any other yeah, I think any so. further points to add? I think so. Awesome. So, so I looked. The next three chapters are only about 20 pages or so, I think. Seven, Should, eight. See, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, it's about not even 20 pages. So should we do three more? Yeah, let's let's do let's do three more. We've we've been doing three chapters so far. Okay. Uh, chapter five was a little bit longer than some of the other chapters, but yeah, yeah, these three chapters seem reasonable. So next time around, if you guys want to join us, we're going to be looking at chapters seven, eight, and nine. So thank you all so much for uh, joining us for Kropotkin.